Hi there, my name is Megan Dodson. I'm a meteorologist at the National Weather Service in Northern Indiana. And I'm going to talk to you today about the thunderstorm spectrum. What kind of thunderstorms uh, are they? How can you tell the difference? And just the basic, uh, in a basic sense. So with that being said, we'll jump right in. Uh, you can see on the first slide here, we have the single cell pulse storm. That's your general garden variety, non-sphere thunderstorms, um, in, the most, in most cases anyways. Uh, and then you go into more of the severe or non-severe, depending on the environment, with multi-cell storms. And then you can also, on the farther end of the spectrum, get into the supercells, which are the more significant storms responsible for our largest uh, tornadoes. Um, and keep in mind that when we go through this, um, we'll talk about the various hazards associated with each one. They don't always fit into these types. These can change one or more uh, times during their existence. It doesn't always have to be a single cell. It can evolve as it goes along. And it also note that the atmosphere conditions with these will determine what kind of weather occurs. So while we're saying generally you don't see severe weather with single cell pole storms, if you have a certain type of environment, you might see some isolated severe weather. So with that being said, let's jump right in and learn some more details about these various types of storms. Uh, the first was a single cell thunderstorm. Again, these are just your pulse storm, your gar garden variety thunderstorms, and generally the threat of severe weather is pretty isolated or low. Um, with the wind, you're going to see uh, some gusty winds, some small hail, and maybe some heavy rain. Those are probably your biggest threats in that mature stage of a, a general thunderstorm, generally about 10 to, 10 to 20 minutes or so. Um, tornado threat with these is very low to none. Uh, most of the time you see wind and hail that's very small, not really anything significant. Um, when you're on the ground, this is what you see is just a single storm uh, with an updraft, and you can see a little anvil there. But generally, again, just it'll be a quick 10 to 20 minute thing, nothing to really worry about um, with it besides lightning and things. So when you get into a little bit more down the spectrum, you have a multi-cell cluster. And what this is is basically it's a group of single cells in different thunderstorm life cycle stages. So um, in this case, low to moderate is your threat. And again, like we said earlier, it's going to depend on your environment, whether you get severe weather or not. But a lot of times, uh, wind uh, and hail is the main threat because it's a group of those single cell storms. But heavy rain can also be a more significant threat when you get these multi-cell clusters because a lot of times if there's some kind of stalled boundaries, like, say like a front, um, you could actually get thunderstorms to keep redeveloping along that line and stay generally in the same spot. Um, that can cause some flooding if the downstream movement of those storms is very slow. Tornado threat with these is generally pretty low. Uh, sometimes you can get brief spin-ups, but that's more likely once you get into the uh, higher end of the spectrum for multi-cells. But generally speaking, most of the time, the severe weather threat is low to moderate. And when you're in the field, this is what you'll see, something similar to this, where you have a group of single cells, all of them in different life cycle stages. So for example, to the right, we have towering cumulus clouds that are new growth. Um, they're just starting up. The one in the middle there, the strongest thunderstorm, is, is very healthy. You could tell those cloud edges are very well defined as more of a typical uh, sign of a more uh, healthy storm. Versus over on the left, you see some decaying and weakening storms where it looks more uh, blurry looking or washed out uh, versus more like a cauliflower, like the middle storm looks like. So this is what you'll typically see with a multi-cell cluster in the field. What do we see on radar here? Well, when we work at the National Weather Service, we see a lot of just general storms. You can see the areas that are in the red signifying the more heavy precipitation, very scattered, and uh, not a real distinct shape, just kind of there. So uh, it's nothing really definite that you'll see on radar, it's just very scattered nature. Um, as far as multi-cell squall lines, when you start getting a uh, better environment for thunderstorms, for example, more instability, uh, more wind shear, you can start seeing a moderate to high threat for severe weather. And that's what you see when you have multi-cell squall lines. You may have heard the term derecho. Um, that's an extreme example of a squall line that comes through um, that can cause significant widespread wind damage. Um, with these storms, like I said, the winds are the main threat. Uh, a lot of times you get these really strong uh, wind gusts, or straight line winds. You get medium to large hail depending on um, what the environment's like because those updrafts are a little bit stronger so they can hold those hailstones and grow them uh, for a longer period of time aloft. Uh, you can also see the heavy rain, but a lot of times this is a very quick heavy rain because the storm will move through uh, pretty quickly. They're generally fa fast moving. 
as not as much of a high threat of heavy rain and flooding, uh, but it is possible. And the tornado threat's a little bit higher with these because a lot of times uh, when you have that strong gust of wind, you can get brief spin-ups that we call, we call them, or gust nados along the leading edge of that line. And these are very short-lived, they're very quick, they're t typically an EF0, EF1 scale uh, most of the time. There is extreme examples, but uh, these aren't your big Oklahoma supercells that you typically see. Keep in mind that even if there isn't a tornado, these, some of the winds along these can be up to 90 miles an hour to 100 miles an hour. It just depends on the environment and strength. What does it look like on radar? Well, typically you see something that's shaped like a bow, um, and where you would have the arrow, if it was a bow and arrow, would be right at the apex of that bow, which is where the strongest winds typically occur. Um, so if you see something like that coming towards you and you're looking at your radar on your phone, um, you know what you're expecting. Additionally, when you look in the field, you might see something like what's on the right. Now, it's not always going to look exactly like this. This is an example. But you'll see a shelf cloud, which will go over in the section about um, cloud identification. And that is signifying the approach of stronger winds. Last but certainly not least is the supercell. These are responsible for the most significant U.S. tornadoes. These are the EF4s, EF5s, and hail larger than golf balls. So generally when we have a supercell situation, we know that the threat is high for all types of severe weather, especially tornadoes, heavy rain, hail, and wind. Um, extreme winds and flash flooding. Flash flooding typically can occur depending on the area, um, but for the most part, these are the ones that you're going to see your tornado with. Now, I will say that typically we don't see these in, in northern Indiana, Michigan, uh, the Great Lakes states. It's typically a little bit more messy looking. It doesn't always look exactly like this picture, but you should still be able to identify them because we do get them occasionally, as we'll see in a minute. For example, if you're in the field, this might be what you see. You might see a updraft tower with a wall cloud beneath that, which is where you're typically going to see that tornado. To the right, you'll see the downdraft where the precipitation is falling, um, and also an anvil, and then we also have some modest clouds in the upper left. So this is typically what you'll see, but like I said, it's not always as clear cut here in the Great Lakes. This is actually an example of when we do have sometimes supercells. Um, up in the upper peninsula of Michigan in Marquette, we had some bigger hail with that. Um, and so this is typically what some you would actually see in real life. Now what do we see when we look at the radar and what do you see when you see the radar on your phone? If you see something that looks more like a kidney bean with a little hook at the end of it, so we call a hook echo, and that typically is where you're going to find your tornado. When you compare that with the velocity data we get from the radar, you can see that those reds and greens that are really close to one another, where the uh, little arrows are, indicate that there's really fast rotation there, and that signifies to us that there's something going on there. There's a tornado of some sort, or at least it's rotating and could produce one. So a lot of times when we issue our warnings, you'll see it says Doppler radar indicated. That's what we're keying off of, is something similar to this on the radar. 